In affiliation with the International Society, the Canadian Society of Air Safety Investigators presents Bloodborne Pathogen Training, the correct use of personal protective equipment at the aircraft accident scene. Not all accident scenes require the use of full or even partial bloodborne pathogen personal protective equipment. The first step in the investigation is an initial site examination to determine the level of risk and then the level of protection necessary. If there are no injuries on or around the site, then no protection for bloodborne pathogens will be required. If the injuries or fatalities are limited to one small area, then that area alone will require the use of protection. Obviously, if there is massive devastation with loss of life or serious injuries, the entire site may require the use of personal protective equipment for all personnel permitted within its boundaries. But before an investigator even gets to the site, the first line of defense to be considered is vaccination. Ensure that each investigator has had the opportunity to protect themselves with all possible blood-borne pathogen vaccinations. An investigator working a small accident alone must be very organized. After determining that full protective equipment is required, they should lay out all the materials they will need in an organized way outside of the contaminated area. Make sure that the equipment needed to clean up after entry into the site is ready before suiting up. For cleanup after site entry, the following items are needed. Extra latex or plastic gloves, cleaning pads or solution, and a biohazard disposal bag. Before putting on any piece of equipment, it must be checked to make sure that it has no damage. Examine each piece thoroughly. Rather than having to deal with jewelry items at the site, it is always best to leave them at home. However, if there are items that may be contaminated or cause damage, they must be removed. A watch may be difficult or impossible to clean properly if it is contaminated. Rings present a problem in that they could easily catch and tear gloves. Earrings may catch on the straps of masks or goggles. Place all of these items in a glove to contain them and then place the tied off glove in a pocket. Having checked the biohazard suit for tears or holes, it can be put on. The order in which the protective equipment is put on is not critically important as there is no danger of contamination while dressing. The order in which the equipment comes off after being in the biohazard area will matter. It is best to have a suit that is very large and can accommodate any person wearing any amount of clothing. In harsh winter climates where the investigator may require winter wear, the biohazard suit will need to be large enough to cover all the clothing yet still permit ease of movement. When a suit is so large on a person that it causes a safety problem, for example tripping hazard, this can be solved with the use of masking or duct tape to take up the slack. Be cautious when using tape to make sure you do not make the suit so tight it will be difficult or impossible to get off without cutting it off after being in the contaminated area. When putting on the boots or foot protection, keep in mind that the purpose is to protect all clothing inside the suit from contamination. Make sure that the suit pant leg is outside of the boot. This ensures that any liquid running down the suit towards the ground will stay outside of the boot instead of dripping inside and contaminating the inner sock and shoe. In selecting the type of foot protection to be worn, consideration should be given to the hazard a loose protector may present to the individual when wearing it. The inner glove is the glove that provides the blood-borne pathogen protection. This glove can be made of either latex or plastic and may be provided in many different colors. Remember that the color of any of the equipment is not an indication of the protection it provides. Some investigators may wish to double up the protection of the inner glove by wearing two layers. This is a matter of personal choice, but one glove will provide adequate protection. Use the same principle for the sleeves of the biohazard suit as for the pant legs. Keep the suit cuff outside of the glove. Put the mask over the nose and mouth under the hood, making sure that it fits comfortably in place. Some investigators report that they will use a few drops of air freshener or scented oil in the mask to make the smells of the accident scene less difficult to tolerate.
Most goggles will fit comfortably over glasses. Put the hood over the head, ensuring all straps and hair are contained within. Zip up the suit, taking care not to catch the latex gloves in the zipper and thereby tearing them. Finally, place on the work gloves. These gloves can be of any type that will provide protection against sharp objects, tearing the inner glove or cutting the individual's hands. The outer work gloves do not provide protection against bloodborne pathogens. After a last mental check, suit no rips or tears, suit pant legs over boots, suit arm cuffs over inner gloves, mask and goggles under hood, suit zipped up with nothing exposed, the investigator may enter the biohazard area and complete the work required. Working in a biohazard area with full bloodborne pathogen personal protective equipment on is tiring. Individuals must be constantly vigilant of normal actions that could contaminate them. Additionally, while in the suit, the investigator will be hot and humid, as well as perhaps a bit claustrophobic. For these reasons, working sessions should be limited in time to ensure the investigator is still effective and not suffering from dehydration or fatigue. Upon returning from the biohazard area after work, the most important thing to consider is to slow down. The investigator is often tired and may have personal needs. All of these make it difficult to take the time and attention to the undressing process that will ensure that no contamination occurs. Take off the outer work gloves. These may be either thrown out or used again. Unzip the suit for removal. Be extremely careful not to catch the inner glove in the zipper and as a result, tear it. Make sure the zipper is completely open as this assists in removing the suit. When removing the suit, the outside must not touch the inner clothes or body. Additionally, the latex gloves, which are considered to be contaminated, must not touch the inner clothes or body. All movements when getting out of the suit should be subdued as violent or jerky actions are more likely to knock particles off the suit and onto the inner clothing. The boots may be either removed with the suit or after it. Sometimes the boots come off naturally, making it more difficult to keep them on when removing the pant portion. The suit is now considered a biohazard and will be disposed of in the biohazard bag. It should be placed with minimum handling into that bag. If it is possible to sit down while removing the pants and boots, do so, but care must be taken to ensure that the area being sat upon has not itself been contaminated. There is an error in the demonstration video with the removal of the boots. The person takes off the contaminated boots and then stands in the same place, which would be contaminated, with their clean shoes. This action would contaminate their clean shoes. What should you do? A pan of disinfectant is normally put between the contaminated area and the area that is clean. You step into the pan of disinfectant, move your boots about so that the boots are cleaned, and then step out of the pan onto the clean ground and take off the boots. If there is no pan of disinfectant, you will have to be very careful to continuously move away from the contaminated area as you remove the layers of protective clothing. The boots, like the outer work gloves, may either be thrown out or used again. If they are to be used again, they must be handled as contaminated unless they are clean. If they are to be thrown away, they must be considered a biohazard. The inner gloves, which are contaminated, must now be changed before approaching the face area. To change the gloves, grasp the first glove on its outer edge with the other hand, peel off the glove, turning it inside out as it is removed. Then, using the inside, clean area of the first glove, the second glove is removed in a similar manner. Dispose of the inner gloves in the biohazard bag. Using a biohazard cleaning cloth, thoroughly clean the hands. Ensure that all parts of the hands have contact with the solution on the cloth and continue the cleaning process until the towelette and the hands are completely dry. This ensures two things. 
that there has been enough time for the disinfectant to have effect, and that the hands are dry enough to put into a clean pair of gloves. It is this stage that many individuals find difficult to give sufficient time. The towelettes, or liquid gels, whichever is used, require over a full minute to completely dry. Patience is required. The facial area, eyes, nose, mouth, are possible entry points for pathogen exposure. This is why re-gloving at this time is critical. Hands brought to the facial area should be as free from contamination as possible. Once the hands are clean and dry, place on a new set of the latex plastic gloves. If the cleaning and drying process has been rushed, this step will be more difficult to accomplish. Bending forward to prevent any dust that has settled on the top of the mask or goggles from dropping into the face, remove both the mask and goggles. The mask will be disposed of as a biohazard. The goggles may be cleaned for future use. Before taking off the latex gloves, do any cleaning up required. When cleaning material for reuse, ensure that you get all parts of the item. If the item can take full immersion in solution, this is the most thorough and easiest method to use. Cleaning solutions with a percentage of bleach may be used to immerse reusable items. If using a solution cleaning cloth, keep cleaning until the cloth and the item are completely dry. Remove the last set of gloves and bag them. Tie off the bag and ensure it is disposed of in a facility equipped for biohazard disposal. Usually this is associated with hospitals or medical facilities. After the bag is tied off, clean the hands again and when possible follow up with a complete washing with water and soap. There are a number of errors or faux pas that can be made both in undressing or at the scene itself. They may seem silly, but they are very easy to make. Touching a clean part of the body or clothing with a contaminated hand is the most common error. And when that has happened, a natural tendency is to make sure no one saw, ignore or hide the action, and try to get away with it. That is a false hope the contamination has occurred. Other problems can be simple actions we are used to. For example, checking the time on a watch or arranging clothing. Any time the individual slips up and contaminates themselves, they must take the extra time and care to ensure that further contamination does not take place. Most accident investigations are done as teams. There is a tremendous advantage in having other team members to help when using bloodborne pathogen personal protective equipment. At a large site, dressing or cleaning type stations may be set up at the entry and exit points. This helps individuals entering the site to get dressed quicker and most importantly can help them in returning from the site to get cleaned up faster with less chance for contamination and error. All the principles covered in the dressing and undressing for the lone investigator are the same. The process is merely expedited. Pagers, cell phones, and jewelry must be removed. The suit must be checked for tears and holes. The inner latex or plastic gloves must be put under the cuff of the suit. The pant cuffs must be placed over the boots. The mask fitted comfortably over the face under the hood. The goggles on over glasses and under the hood. The suit fully zipped up. The work gloves over the latex gloves. And a final check head to toe back to front. Once the investigator has finished working in the biohazard area, they can return to the entry exit point and be assisted in getting out of the suit. This process is much faster than having the individual take all the precautions themselves. There is an error in this video with respect to the boots. Prior to walking up to the people who will help, there would be a pan of disinfectant. The person coming from the contaminated area would step into the pan and move their boots around so that the boots are rinsed. 
Then step out of the pan onto the clean ground and proceed to the assistants. The work gloves are removed and an assistant takes care of them. The suit is removed ensuring that the outside contaminated surface does not touch the inner clothing or body. Also taking care that the assistant's hands do not touch the inner clothing or body. Boots are removed and either disposed of or cleaned by the assistants. The investigator may move to another cleaner area or one of the assistants will re-glove to ensure that the gloves going near the investigator's face are clean. With the head bent downward to prevent any particles falling onto the face, the goggles and mask are removed and either disposed of or cleaned as appropriate. Lastly, the inner gloves are removed and the investigator can wipe down their hands with the antibiotic wipe, following up with a soap and water wash when possible. All accident investigations present their own unique hazards. Sometimes protection against blood-borne pathogens is an issue. At other times, it is not. The information contained herein will help protect investigators when a biohazard exists.